Welcome to the Starfleet Leadership Academy, a leadership development podcast told through the lens of Star Trek. And now here's your host, Jeff Aiken. Welcome everyone, and thanks for joining me today. Slight spoiler alert here. I love this episode. It is so much of what makes Deep Space Nine amazing. And a big part of that is how Cisco supports his team, even through the worst. See what I mean? As we watch the 18th episode of the sixth season of Deep Space Nine, Inquisition. Bashir's off to a medical conference. Where is it? Riser? Casperia Prime? Casperia. How'd you guess? Interesting how conferences always seem to happen at cool places like that. I mean, there's never there's never a big conference in, I don't know, like Casper, Wyoming. Welcome to Casper, Wyoming. This central Wyoming town is a mecca for outdoor enthusiasts and history buffs alike. No offense to anyone in Wyoming, of course. But O'Brien, O'Brien comes in with a dislocated shoulder from kayaking. Bashir fixes him up real quick and heads out. Have a good time at Casperia. I'm going to a medical conference, not on vacation. Whatever you say. Huh? Bashir's alarm goes off in the morning and he just can't believe it. We've all been there, right? Like, it's time to start the day, and it feels like you just laid down maybe five minutes ago? Well, that's Bashir today. He grabs his gear, heads off to the shuttle, but Cisco calls all the senior officers to ops. Oh, this isn't good. Internal Affairs is here. It's a Deputy Director Sloan. You might be a king or a little street sweeper, but sooner or later you dance with the reaper. <laughs> they believe there's a Dominion spy on board the station and are confining all the senior officers to quarters so they can conduct an investigation. But don't worry, we've already informed Starfleet Medical that you won't be attending your conference. Oh, that's very considerate of you. Sloan gives instructions that they are not to talk with each other during the investigation and that he hopes to wrap this up as quickly as possible. In his quarters, Bashir's trying to get some hot buttered scones from the replicator, but, but it's not responding. Oh man, sounds really good right now. He's going with red leaf tea with the scones. I'd be more about some delicious aromatic black coffee, but, but I can get on board with Bashir's breakfast, that's for sure. He's called to the wardroom for his interview with Sloan. A very, very uptight security guard escorts him. But the interview... Seems to go well. Actually, when I first came in here, I uh, half suspected that uh, I would be interrogated under a very bright light. And it's over pretty quickly. They talk about when he was abducted by the Dominion back in season five. That was about a year ago. And then the time that he helped a group of socially outcast people that were also genetically engineered just like he is. That happened. That actually happened just a few episodes before this one, I think. On his way back to his quarters, Sloan Sooner or later you dance with the Reaper. <laughs> says they've disabled the replicators and takes his breakfast order old school style. Comes via room service. And, as one might expect if they've traveled enough, they messed up the order. He ended up getting Worf's breakfast, which was a deliciously disgusting wriggly plate of live gach. So now he's tired and super hungry. He notices that his stuff's been moved around, his quarters have been searched. And despite the attempts to isolate everyone, O'Brien reaches out to Bashir on a communication panel. He says he was interrogated for hours. About you. Every question was about Bashir. He cuts the communication quickly so they don't get caught. But seconds after that, Sloan asks him to come back to the wardroom. I was going over my notes from our last conversation and there are a couple things I'd like you to clarify. Oh. He starts really diving into the five weeks he spent in a Dominion internment camp. His theory is that Bashir was, well, basically brainwashed. And grammatic dissociation. So because of Bashir's genetic engineering, he thinks that the Dominion were able to compartmentalize his brain. So he acts as a spy, but he's not even aware of it. There's no chance of you getting caught because you don't even realize you're working for them. When they want to debrief you, all they do is trigger your memory. They're able to crack the code and get him to share info, but Bashir would have no idea that was even happening. This is, this is terrifying. And worse, it's indefensible. If, if the brainwashing works, like if this is true, Bashir would have no idea what he's doing and, and no control over it. So he can't even admit to anything, but, but he also can't prove he's not doing anything, any, 
any defense that was put up can be swatted away just by saying that it's the engrammatic dissociation. It's, uh, it's quite the trap Sloan has laid here. Then Sloan ramps it up. You want to do things the hard way? Fine. And officially charges him and sends him to the brig. They cuff him and walk him through the promenade on their way. Is it really necessary to drag a Starfleet officer across the promenade in irons? This is one of many moments we're going to see Cisco step up for Bashir. As they lock him up, the security guards insult. They demean him. They, they really make this personal. But I love it. Bashir stands up for himself. He doesn't take it at all. So nice to see you enjoying your work. They stop just short of shoving him in as they take his communicator badge and tell him to get in his cell. You won't be needing this anymore. Step inside. Step inside. After a short while, Cisco comes in and demands one-on-one -on -one time with Bashir. Sloan tries to stop him, but Cisco pulls rank. Have you received orders from Starfleet to relieve me of my command of this station? No, I haven't. Well then. He says that he demands being present at all questionings moving forward to be sure that Bashir's rights are respected. So cut to an interrogation that has clearly been going on for quite a while. Both Bashir and Sisko are just looking wiped and exhausted. This is irrelevant. He tries helping, but, but Sloan just keeps on it. Nothing is deterring him. He goes through a litany of lies that Bashir's told through his life, all to hide his genetic engineering. Cisco says he, he eventually came clean, right? So it should be cool, but, but Sloan won't accept that. What made you confess? It was because you realized that it was your duty to be honest with your captain? No. It was because you felt guilty for having lied to him for so long? No. Then why did you come forward? I was found out. After the interrogation, Bashir pleads with Cisco. How can I defend myself to this man? But honestly, even Cisco is starting to question. He says he believes that Bashir's not lying, like he doesn't believe he did anything, but, but he does see that it's possible he could have been brainwashed. He could be working for the Dominion without knowing it. He leaves and Bashir just drops to the deck, defeated. After a short amount of time, Sloan Sooner or later you dance with the Reaper. <laughs> wakes him up to transfer him to Starbase 53. They go to cuff him, and suddenly he's transported away. It's a Cardassian transporter beam. He finds himself suddenly face-to-face -face with a Vorta. The Vorta. He's face-to-face -face with Weyoun. If you remember, the Vorta are the administrative, kind of leadership species of the Dominion. They lead Jem'Hadar forces, and they handle the, the diplomatic and kind of commercial relations. Weyoun tells Bashir that they've come to rescue him and debrief him as well. But Bashir fires back. I'm not working for you. I'm not a Dominion spy. You actually believe that, don't you? That's why you're such a good operative. Weyoun confirms everything that Sloane has been saying. He says this has been going on for a very long time and Bashir starts to break. I don't, I don't, I don't remember, I don't remember any of it. Wayun offers him some food. Remember, Bashir still hasn't eaten anything through all of this. And it happens to be hot buttered scones. Apparently, Wayun used scones as part of the engrammatic dissociation. He keeps trying to get Bashir to crack, but he bounces back. He reiterates that he is not a spy. Then he notices some very interesting patterns. Why would you both be trying to convince me of the same lie? Unless... Suddenly, a ship, the Defiant, attacks the Cardassian ship. Kira and Worf beam over and rescue Bashir. Well, maybe rescue isn't the right word. Honestly, they've arrested him. They start digging into him, much like the security guards were earlier. I have had enough of your lies, Doctor. You can't just dismiss what I'm saying. Because if I'm right, there's no telling what kind of damage Sloan Get can do. him off my bridge. Let's go, Doctor. He pleads for help from for, from everyone, from anyone, and they all turn him away. He then turns to his best friend, to O'Brien, but O'Brien pushes, physically pushes Bashir away. Your shoulder. And that is the moment it all falls apart. He would have still been healing from the kayaking incident from the beginning of the episode. Suddenly, the scene fades away and Bashir's in a holodeck. Sloan and two security guards dressed in harsh, Black leather standing there. 
Sloan says this has all been an enhanced interrogation technique that has proven that Bashir is indeed not a spy for the Dominion. They intentionally kept him hungry and tired and put him through all these paces to see if he was or, or wasn't a spy. They beamed him out of his quarters when he was asleep just before he was going to leave for his trip and put him into this holodeck simulation. I believe we allowed you a full hour. So that's why he was so tired. I wonder, I wonder if that's what happens to me. Like, I'm just kind of beamed from holodeck to holodeck after, I don't know, maybe an hour of sleep. <laughs> They concocted this whole scenario to keep him under stress and to test if he'd been brainwashed. O'Brien's injury happened after they prepped everything, so they weren't aware that it happened. And then, then Bashir flips the script and asks who Sloan is and who he works for. Let's just say I belong to another branch of Starfleet Intelligence. Our official designation is Section 31. They do the dirty work that keeps things running smoothly in the Federation. Totally covert, completely secret. They're an autonomous department. Bashir has a real problem with this. He says it flies in the face of everything the Federation stands for. But then Sloan tries to get Bashir to join Section 31. A few minutes ago, you were calling me a traitor. And now you want to recruit me. He adamantly shuts him down and they send him back to Deep Space Nine. But not before a huge Flex. Bashir threatens to tell everyone about Section 31 to reveal their secret, and Sloan responds, Let's just say I'm not going to lose any sleep over it. Odo, Kira, and Sisko are talking about Sloan and Section 31. Sisko says that Starfleet has no record of Sloan. And as for Section 31, that's a little more complicated. They'll neither confirm nor deny its existence. Sisko wants to learn more about them. He wants to get at them. But Odo completely understands why the Federation would have a Section 31. Personally, I find it hard to believe they wouldn't. Every other great power has a unit like Section 31. The Romulans have the Tal Shiar. The Cardassians had the Obsidian Order. But neither Bashir nor Sisko are okay with that. Sisko tells Bashir that the next time Sloan comes around, that he wants Bashir to agree to work with them. He wants him to infiltrate the organization. And the next time he asks you to join his little group... You will say yes. What a cool concept for an episode. I mean, it's not unique in Star Trek, the whole parallel experience thing, but this one was done just, I think, just so masterfully. The real life portion of this episode ended when Bashir left the med bay to go to sleep and then picked up again in the holodeck. Everything else that we watched was an illusion. Honestly, maybe this isn't the worst way to work a confession out of a suspect. I mean, this would be pretty easy, right? All you got to do is create a holographic environment that they would believe is real, put them in a situation where they would do the, do the bad thing or reveal who the bad person was. Now, hmm, if we can just figure out that whole holodeck thing. Come to Quark's crisis fun. Come right now. Don't walk. Run. So much of this episode just flies in the face of Gene Roddenberry's vision. I mean, at least at first glance. Famously, or maybe infamously. Infamous is, is when you're more than famous. Roddenberry insisted that there not be any conflict between members of the crew. He believed society would have evolved past petty conflict by the 24th century. He also painted the Federation as this utopia where everyone worked to support each other and they would cling to their principles no matter what. DS9 was always meant to be a little darker than, than TOS and TNG were, but Ira Stephen Bear can be credited for taking it to where it went. He became co-showrunner at the beginning of Season 3, and then when Michael Piller went on to start Voyager, Bear became the sole showrunner. Much of what we see from late Season 3 on is from his mind. And in my opinion... He still bought in to Roddenberry's vision, but in a much more pragmatic way. Yeah, the Federation was a utopia, but not everyone wants to live in paradise. Like That was the approach and the thought that we heard in the episode DS9 for the cause. Nobody leaves paradise. Everyone should want to be in the Federation. Hell, you even want the Cardassians to join. It was one of my favorite Starfleet Leadership Academy podcast episodes. But Roddenberry wanted all things Federation to sparkle and shine, but, but Bear understood and portrayed that even shiny things have, have an underside to them. 
This episode, though, goes where Roddenberry would never have gone before. A black ops unit that answers to no one? That's comparable to the worst of the worst in the Tal Shiar and the Obsidian Order? Now, we got a taste of the Tal Shiar when we talked about TNG's unification and face of the enemy. Like, how could Starfleet have an equivalent of that? Well, they do. And I think it says so much about anyone's vision of a utopia. As we go deeper into Star Trek Discovery, we'll talk more about Section 31. We'll hit on them as well in Enterprise. But the overarching question, at least from me, will be similar to Bashir's in this episode. Why? Why would the Federation stoop to such a level? And by stooping to this level, are they invalidating everything the Federation stands for? We've talked a few times on this podcast about the concept of the ends justifying the means. Recently, in the Starfleet Leadership Academy episode, TNG Code of Honor, we examined this pretty closely. In that episode, Picard decided that the ends do not justify the means and went so far as to put Lieutenant Yar's life in danger, as well as the planet suffering from the pandemic. But by having Section 31 as an active department, The Federation is at least implying that the ends do indeed justify the means. In fact, Sloan even says as much. If you knew how many lives we've saved, I think you'd agree that the ends do justify the means. He goes on to make a compelling case based on the many, many lives Section 31 has saved. I love this, honestly, about Star Trek. Intentionally or not, it provides us with these ethical and philosophical quandaries that that don't necessarily have a definitive answer. Okay, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna do something here that that oh gosh, I'm gonna do something that I might regret. But but leadership is about stepping out of our comfort zones and helping others to do the same, right? So here goes. I want you to go to the Starfleet Leadership Academy Facebook group, and I want you to take a position on this. We can do it debate team style, right? So do the ends, justify the means. Take the pro or the against, and let's debate this. High school debate team style, right? No name calling, no politics. In fact, to help keep it clean, or at least, I don't know, more clean, let's try to keep the topics and the examples focused on Star Trek. That's the way you do it. That's the way you debate. If the ends do justify the means, then... Put simply, Section 31 is the most important part of the Federation. I'm excited to see what happens when Bashir agrees to work with them. I want to see what he finds out. This is a fantastic episode of Deep Space Nine. It's well-written, well-paced, and very, very thought-provoking. And it even has Jeffrey Combs. We've talked about him a little bit. We met him as basically the worst person in the world in DS9 Meridian. But as Wayun, he is amazing. We're going to learn more about Wayun when we get to some of the deeper Dominion War episodes. But suffice it to say that he lasted as long on the series as he did completely as a result of Jeffrey Combs just nailing the character. Oh, and I haven't even mentioned William Sadler as Sloan yet. Death himself. You might be a king or a little street sweeper, but sooner or later you dance with the reaper. (laughs) He's such a powerful on-screen presence and was perfect for this role. I think I read somewhere that they almost cast Martin Sheen in this role. Now that would have been fantastic, but I think Sadler, Sadler is perfect. He has, he has an edge, an, an edge that Sheen, I don't know, in my opinion, only really lets fly as a voice actor. That's not true. They have the Citadel. They've got us fighting each other instead of fighting them. I just need to. But even during the interrogation scenes, he has those moments where where you just want to like him. Where his humanity breaks through even, even just for an instant. But then with just the slightest shift, he is terrifying. Section 31 to a T. And what is it that makes Deep Space Nine my favorite series? (laughs) The characters and their relationships. Yes, Bashir is genetically engineered. Yes, he is absolutely brilliant. But it wasn't either of those things that saved him or exposed the ruse. No, it was his relationships with O'Brien and Cisco. He knew them. He knew them so well and knew at least O'Brien's physical state that their behavior is what tipped him off. 
even in an episode focused on just one person. That's yeah, that's two episodes in a row for us like that. But in an episode focused on just one person, we see the depth and value of the character development in this series. Command codes verified. Captain Benjamin Sisko is such a strong leader that even in a holographic representation, he stands up for his crew and gets right between them in danger. Bashir's observation that Sisko was acting weird wasn't as apparent as O'Brien's shoulder. No, because it was about his leadership style. As it was all coming together, Bashir said, And you're not Captain Sisko. He'd at least be willing to hear me out. Sisko demonstrates exactly what it looks like to be a leader when the people you work with are in trouble or in danger. The Starfleet Leadership Academy is supported by listeners just like you. Click the link in the show notes to support the ongoing production of this podcast. When Sloan first rolls in, Sisko is a begrudging participant. He doesn't like what's going on, but there, there really isn't anything he can do about it. But the second things get out of control, he is right on it. He's in that brig as soon as he knows Bashir's in there, and he's fighting for his teammate. Sloan seems to have an answer for everything Sisko throws at him, so he settles for an advocacy role. But he inhabits that role. He sits in on the interrogation. He pushes back. He asks questions and tries to set Bashir up as best as he can to be successful. Even when he has reason to doubt Bashir, he's still supportive and commits to ensuring that at least his rights aren't violated. This is one of the primary jobs for any leader. Deep Space Nine, without any people on it, is just a hunk of metal in space. Your organization, your program, your shop, your restaurant, your place of business without people is just a building or a bunch of buildings, depending on how big your company is. My point is that without people, there is nothing. So you may look at someone like Cisco and say his job is to administer the day-to-day -day operations of a space station or to act as a liaison between various governments, enforcing treaties where applicable and negotiating them as needed. And yeah, those are all things he does, but they aren't the core of his job. It's not your job, princess. Stop calling me princess! His job is to support the people that make Deep Space Nine what it is. So what's your job? Is it writing the schedule for the week? Streamlining and maximizing EBITDA? Is it counting out the tills at the end of the night? Well, I'd say those are certainly things that many of you do. But your job as a leader is to support the people that make your organization what it is. It is very, very unlikely that you're going to have a situation where one of your employees is being investigated for being a spy. Unlikely, but the probability is not zero. So you're telling me there's a chance. I mean, I know what some of you do for a living. But still, what are situations that your team may encounter where you'd need to Cisco up? I recently helped out on a company's campaign where they were trying to light a fire under one of their partners and start moving more of their product. They assigned reps by region and set up incentives for them to connect with the partner's people in the area. It got pretty competitive, and one of the reps started accusing one of the others of stealing their prospects. Things escalated quickly, and it didn't take long for the accused rep to reach out saying they felt threatened and unsafe. I was on the call with them and their manager, and the manager did such a great job. They listened, they got the facts, but they also listened with empathy to try and help the person and feel heard and to help them feel at least a little more safe. The next call was with the accuser. Now, both of these people report to the same person, so that made this all a little bit easier. But once again, that manager did a great job. Much like we talked about in the episode on DS9, Things Past, they listened with curiosity and asked great questions. They didn't come in accusing the person of anything, but instead tried to understand what was happening from their perspective. It became apparent very quickly that this guy's numbers were terrible, and he figured attacking someone that was doing well would be better than stepping up his game. This is when the manager Cisco'd up. They told the rep, that their behavior was unacceptable and that if anything like this happened again, and I'll never forget when they said this, it was, it was so ridiculous and so awesome at the same time. But they said that if they went after any reps again, especially this one, they'd never work in IT again. 
That was great. Stand up for your team, being being clear with expectations and consequences. But but never work in IT again? <laughs> yeah, I think it would take something so catastrophic that I, I can't even think of it to blacklist someone from that industry. There's enough toxicity it could have its own Avenger, but, but, but that's an entirely different topic. Another example that may be more common and maybe a little more complex, really, is when a customer is freaking out on someone you work with. Are you kidding me? You I came here to buy food from you, you guys. You abuse my customers. Yep, kind of like that. Well, first, and, and I hope this is obvious, you don't leave your person hanging out there by themselves. You get in there. You insert yourself physically between them and point that fire hose right at you. But let's add a dimension to this one. Let's say the customer is right and your teammate did screw something up. You've probably been here before too, I'll bet. They did this and that and I demand that they are fired right now. Now you get to Cisco up twice. First, by getting in there and protecting the person you work with. But again by standing up for them, even if they were wrong. Now, that doesn't mean lying to the customer. That means you control the situation, not them. You try something like this. I understand you're upset and would like them to be fired. They did this and that. I mean, if that happened to me, I would be furious too. Now, let's go over here where I can talk to you about something other than firing my employee and do it in a place where you're not putting on a show for everyone. Use empathy, listen to them, even even agree with them, but do not agree with the course of action you're going to take with your teammate. That is not their choice. It's yours. Of course, after you finish with the customer, you talk with that employee and you deal with them, whatever that looks like. They don't get a free pass. You hold them accountable and responsible, but you do so on your terms and your organization's. Sloan. Sooner or later, you dance with the Reaper. <laughs> Sorry, I just love Sadler and Bill and Ted. But Sloan saw fit to lock Bashir up. So Cisco went in and did what he could do to get him out of his cell, or at least help as he could. But he didn't sugarcoat anything with Bashir. He told him that he had doubts. He was very honest with him. But he did everything he could to be sure he could take the brunt from what Sloan was throwing. So be Cisco. Stand up for the people you work with. Do not tolerate them being treated poorly, unfairly, or wrong. Even if they are in the wrong, you ensure they are treated with dignity. A leader's first job and responsibility is to the people they work with. Period. No exceptions. If Cisco can do it for an alleged spy as a holographic simulation, then you can do it in real life. We're going to do it. High School Debate Starfleet Leadership Academy style. Join us on the Starfleet Leadership Academy Facebook group. And let's debate both sides of the philosophical and ethical quandary. Do the ends justify the means? You can also follow me on Twitter at SFLA Podcast and all the social media at Jeff T. Aiken. That's Jeff T. as in totally covert. A-K-I-N. Make sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the Starfleet Leadership Academy. Computer, what are we going to watch next time? Working. It's been a long time. Like, I don't know, gosh, 10 episodes since we've gotten Enterprise. But here we are. From the first season, episode 19, Acquisition. Oh, this is a controversial one. The alien they encounter. Well, well, there's one side of the house that believes that space is vast and contact is always possible, while the other side of the house believes that this episode invalidates a ton of Star Trek canon. We'll watch and make our own judgment next time on the Starfleet Leadership Academy. And until then, ex astra scientia. Scientia.